You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week before we get started with this week's episode, which takes us back to Vietnam and a journey through the VA. A whole bunch of news that we need to get to. First off, once again, we want to thank the band Silence and Light and Brad Thomas, a previous guest on the podcast, for providing us with the introduction music for the show. We changed it up in the new year, and Silence and Light was gracious enough to offer us up this track. So check them out at silenceandlightmusic.com, a great band and great people. Also, we have some big news coming up in the new year. We can't exactly divulge all of it right now, but we are partnering with a veteran-owned company that's going to really take this podcast to the next level. We're talking about better audio quality. We're going to add a video component. We are really going to take the hazard ground to the next level in the coming weeks and months, and so stay tuned. I I know it's a really bad tease to kind of say that, but... We are really, really excited. We know you're going to love the changes that are coming. So certainly stay tuned as we have big things happening in 2021 with the Hazard Ground. Don't forget to keep those ratings coming on Apple Podcasts. Ratings and reviews, again, doesn't have to be a long rating. We want to crack the top 100 Apple Podcasts. We are moving right now and really upping those ratings. So it's helping, but continue to do it. Please leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, and we will get to that gold standard, the top 100 Apple Podcasts sooner rather than later. Also, spread the word of the hazard ground. You know, when we started this thing nearly four years ago, the way this has grown has been really completely through word of mouth and you guys out there telling other people about it. So please continue to tell people about the hazard ground. Tell a friend, tell a loved one, share these stories with other people. And as we continue to sort of navigate through these tough times, podcasts are a great way to help pass the time. So share the hazard ground with a friend or a loved one and continue to grow this hazard ground community. Also, want to give a big shout out to Donna, who donated to the podcast last week. You know, we started this thing four years ago, and as I've said, we, we, we've never really made money on this thing and never really tried to. Now, hopefully, we'll start to get some sponsors as we continue to grow, but those donations that you guys have given us over the years have really, really helped us out and offset some of the costs that are associated with doing any podcast, especially one of this level. So again, thanks to Donna, because those donations really, really help us out. Don't forget about our social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground, at Hazard Ground Podcast. Follow us there. Subscribe to the YouTube channel and our Amazon promotion when you go to our website, hazardground.com. You click on the Amazon button at the bottom. It'll take you right to Amazon. You can do all your normal shopping. We'll get a percentage of what you guys spend. And then we donate a percentage of that back to some of the charities featured here on the show. So we hope that everybody is continuing to be healthy and safe in 2021. We're excited about all the big news that we have coming up. So stay tuned with us and stay with us as we go forward. Now let's get on to this week's episode. Joining us this week on the Hazard Ground is a former Marine Corporal whose lone tour was to Vietnam back in 1966. While on a helicopter evacuation mission in Quang Tri Province, he was shot in the head and in the chest, and those injuries eventually led him to the decision to amputate his right arm. Subsequently, he went on to work for the Veterans Affairs Administration and has spent multiple decades in Veterans Affairs working to ensure that all veterans have the benefits that they are so rightly due. He has written a book about his story. It is called Deck House, My Story, and it's available wherever you get books. And he is Donat Dan LeBlanc joining us on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Dan, welcome, man. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Uh, The VA, uh, just kind of curious, when you hear the word VA now, after your experience with it, kind of what are some of the emotions or words that pop into your head? It's a mixed feeling because I, again, my initial experience with the VA was not a good one. Uh, You read about that in the book. Um, But I ended up working for the VA and my primary reason for working for the VA was to try to make change, uh, try to make change from within the organization. And I was pleased with my career in the VA. Um, I'm not happy with the VA today because of what's going on in the system. It just seems to me that uh, um, at least my personal experience at my VA is it's like going back to the 70s all over again. Everything that we've we accomplished through the years seems to have gone backwards. Yeah. And uh, my personal experience with the VA has has been less than stellar. I'll put that delicately. Um, I've told it many times here. If it wasn't for 
a wonderful woman who kind of held my hand and walked me through the entire process, uh, I wouldn't be claiming disability the way I am today. I probably just would have been frustrated and, and, and never went through the process. So um, there are some diamonds in the rough, so to speak, in the VA, but uh, we will dive more into that whole process and that whole experience that you had with it. But let's go back to the beginning and tell us how and why you got in the Marine Corps. <laughs> um, I... <laughs> been asked that question a lot and i think as a as a young man uh the the movie that stuck with me was the movie uh the di with jack webb Mm -hmm. and being uh paris island and boot camp intrigued me uh and i always uh as a young man wanted to be uh, a marine and when i graduated from high school and uh had nothing to look forward to uh college wasn't an option for me uh, working in a mill here locally uh, in my hometown wasn't uh, very pleasant, so I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Again, it was before Vietnam uh, was Vietnam. I enlisted in 1965 and uh, late 64, late 64, and uh, Vietnam wasn't what it became. Right? Yeah, I mean. With, Indochina. Yeah, it's, and, it was like a foreign thing at first, right, that we weren't going to get involved in. Uh, yeah. as, as history unfolded, obviously, it went different. But when you said that you saw the movie and, and Paris Island and Marine Corps boot camp looked like fun, like that's pretty <laughs> contrary to what most people would think. Yeah, well, I it, it was it was challenging. And I think because I was in – I thought I was in great shape uh, when I graduated from high school – I was 162 pounds. I played uh, uh, some football and baseball. Uh, I was athletic, and I just wanted the challenge. And uh, working in a mill wasn't challenging. So I went to Paris Island, and my first day was, oh, my God, what did I do? But uh, I think that's kind of what a lot of guys experience when you first get there is, uh, you know, get off the bus, get off the bus, what the fuck are you doing, hurry up, hurry up get on the yellow footprints and uh, that's how it began. But I I can't say that um, I think the Marine Corps um, made me the man that I wanted to be. Um, And I think that's what Paris Island helped me to survive and survive Vietnam. What about Paris Island and Marine Corps boot camp? do you feel like when you said made you the man you were supposed to be, what were some of those attributes? Well, I think the discipline uh, and the order that was instilled. I mean, people think that uh, Marines are brainwashed and we are to an extent. Uh, We're brainwashed to um, fight for the guy that's next to you, to uh, do the things that are honest and to be squared away. You know, I like order. I can remember um, in the local elementary school, there was a fourth grade teacher uh, who was a former Marine. And he was the only male teacher in the elementary school at the time. And my children went through that through that school and uh, one of them had him. And he was very disciplined. His uh, All of his books were lined up in, in order by size. And he was um, very tough with the kids. But, you know, the kids liked him. They loved him. They enjoyed being with him because he made them toe the mark. He wasn't a lackadaisical kind of guy. Right. And uh, that's kind of what I think I got out of Marine Corps boot camp was that uh, that discipline. Uh, I was uh, what they called aviation guarantee. And I was a mechanic by no means. I had no clue. Uh, which end of the hammer to hold. <laughs> and when I went through uh, Millington, uh, through helicopter school, I became a damn good mechanic and I enjoyed it. And it Marine Corps taught me that as well. They taught me a trade. Unfortunately, uh, because of my wounds, I wasn't able to carry that on in the private sector. Um, and that's what I tell kids today. If you're going to go in the military, uh, make sure you get into a, an MOS that's going to be useful when they get out, if you're going to get out. You know, there's not a lot of call for uh, machine gunners in the private sector. No, but that's why all the kids nowadays want to go cyber, right? Because it's the biggest thing in the world. 
um, when it comes to the civilian side. Helps you out. Helps you out a lot. Uh, so let's go back to uh, you graduate from boot camp and. Uh, your next uh, position is where, and, and when do you start to hear the words Vietnam? Well, we actually started it in, in boot camp. Oh, really? Uh, we, had a, uh, we had four drill instructors, and one of them was a corporal who was in Vietnam who had just come back from Vietnam early. I don't know if he was an advisor or what he was, uh, but they were talking about, you know, when you go to Vietnam, and that was the first time we had heard the word Vietnam. Um, and then we went from, well, I've, I got the uh, meritorious promotion out of boot camp. I got, uh, PFC out of boot camp, which was, um, it was a great thing because only 10% of the guys who leave Paris Island get PFC. So I got my first stripe coming out of boot camp and we went through, uh, ITR, infantry training regiment, um, in, uh, North Carolina at uh, oh, Camp Lejeune. And we went through all of our weapons. Uh, we did uh, BARs. We fired the BARs, a Browning, a Browning automatic rifle. We did hand grenade training. We did the whole circuit, uh, machine gun training. Um, um, geez, we had, uh, they even had a VIL set up. We had, uh, we had a VIL. They did all kinds of stuff at ITR. And then once we left ITR, um, we went on to whatever um, class the guys had. Mine was uh, helicopter school in Millington, Tennessee, outside of Memphis. Um, we did that. Uh, there were very few Marines there at the time. There was, I think, uh, about 20 of us uh, that went through uh, the different schools that they had there, you know, avionics, uh, the electronics, the hydraulics, uh, uh, metal smiths, and uh, and mechanics. I they made me a mechanic. Uh, I wanted to be clerical because <laughs> when they started talking Vietnam, I had no desire to go to Vietnam and be on the front line. But uh, I ended up. Uh, they give you. They gave us three choices, and I got my fourth choice was a mechanic. <laughs> so they made made a mechanic out of me. And uh, like I said, I enjoyed it. I wasn't really good with uh, classwork, as the story is told, um, but I was good in the shop. I, I knew my way around the motor, but um, when I had to take a test, I wasn't really good at taking tests. Uh, and even when I got to Vietnam, uh, the first month in Vietnam, they put you on uh, on a detail and uh, – I was put on mess duty. I got no few jams on mess duty. Um, they thought I was, they thought I was crazy. Uh, I got caught smoking, uh, in front of a couple of 55 gallon gasoline cans by the, uh, XO. I caught hell for that. And then the burn shack burned down. So I was in the middle of that. Uh, but I escaped harmless. I actually got put on, uh, when I went back to the squadron, the following week, I got put on flight, on flight skins. They made me uh, fly in the first week I was there, which was unusual. Because most of the guys, when they come off detail, got put in the hangar deck, rebuilding motors and tail rotors and transmissions and that kind of stuff. I got put fly, in flight status right away, I think, because they thought I was crazy. Um, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my very brief time in the Marine Corps. I was, uh, it was great. And it actually reminds me of uh, the book has brought to me people that I hadn't seen in, God, 50, 60 years. One of the guys that I served with in Millington saw the book on Facebook. And when he asked me about the book, I recognized the name as somebody that I had served with in Millington. Well, it turned out that... Uh, it was this guy and he was, he's up in Northern California and he's very involved in the Marine Corps League as am I. Uh, but he's in a group with a bunch of guys that are, uh, that have PTSD. He's in a, um, it's not really a outreach center, but there are a bunch of guys that get together up there that served in Vietnam 
that are suffering from PTSD. And his wife became friendly with me on Facebook after he did and told me that after he got my book, he's got uh, macular degeneration, so he's having trouble reading. And he mm -hmm. started reading the book with a magnifying glass, but he's having trouble. So she read the book to him, and she said it kind of snapped him out of his bunk. And he he actually contacted me and said that he he called me, and he said that he thought because he was hydraulics, a hydraulics mech, he went in one direction. He went to El Toro, and I went to Vietnam. We never heard from each other again. And we were bunkmates in Millington. Uh, I never got his address. He never got mine. Well, we, re, we hooked up again because of the book, and she told me that because it snapped him out of it, he's become a different guy. He was pleased to find out that I wasn't killed in Vietnam, uh, and was very pleased with the book, and we reconnected. That's happened to two or three other people since the book's been out. That's so it's awesome. Been, it's been great in that respect. Uh, and I really intended for the book to be something for my children and my grandchildren because they grew up – my children grew up with me as dad, the Army amputee, so they know the struggles that I've had through my life, even though I've – always tried to do things on my own. I'm very independent. It's gotten to the point now where my independence is catching up with me. <laughs> and I can't do a lot of things I used to do. And my kids get, my wife gets mad at me when I try to do things that they know I shouldn't be doing. But I did it to tell my grandchildren my story. They only, they see me, but they don't know the backstory, um, how I got to where I am. And, they've had the opportunity now to read the book and um, I've got great kids and I've got tremendous grandchildren. That's awesome. Um, let's go back though uh, to what brought you to where you are now. Uh, you get to Vietnam when, and uh, let's, let's talk about what had happened on September 15th, 1966. Well, we were going in on a mission. Uh, How long were you in Vietnam before it happened? Uh, I got there in April and I got hit in September. Okay. So I was there, what, eight months, uh, six months? Somewhere in that range, about five, six months, sure. Yeah, about six months. And uh, the night before, we flew in uh, from a mission and we landed aboard the uh, the carrier, the Iwo Jima, the LPH-2. And because we were the last ones in, we had to fold the plane and tie it down on the flight deck which meant the next morning we were the first planes out for the next mission. So uh, we uh, got the plane ready for flight status. And the night before it had rained, they had a monsoon and the plane always leaked, leaked like a sieve. Um, our flak jackets were on the, on the floor of the aircraft. So they got soaking wet. So I took them out. I put them on the flight deck to dry out. We ended up, uh, we taxied forward, got the grunts on the plane, and flew to the mission, leaving our flight jackets on the flight deck. Uh, we very seldom wore them anyway, but I put them on the flight deck because they were wet. We did the first mission. The mission was supposed to be a hot zone. Uh, we went into the zone, dropped off the grunts, nothing. No fire. We didn't see any enemy. We didn't get shot at. It was nothing. As we left the ground, we got a call to go on a uh, uh, an extraction. They were uh, they had told us two WIAs and two KIAs, and the rest of the uh, platoon got they walked under an ambush. There was nine other guys that wanted to be extracted. They were uh, Marine Corps recon, so we flew to the uh, coordinates, but the left seat that morning was a new pilot a jet jockey who had just been assigned to the squadron. And I can remember flying into the zone at treetop, which we never did. We always flew in at altitude and then we pulled what they call an auto rotation and dropped into the zone. But we didn't, we flew in like we we're flying into Logan airport. And as we're flying towards the zone, the uh, right seat, the, the pilot is um, doing the coordinates to tell the left seat where to go. And he flew us in a treetop, 
as we started kept getting to the zone, we started to get fire. We took four rounds. One round went below the left seat into the clutch. The next round went behind him into the servos. And the next two rounds went into the window and hit me. Uh, that put me down. Uh, as I was told, the door gunner, the crew chief, told me two days later that he heard fire on my side of the plane. He turned, saw me firing the machine gun, turned back because he started to get fire on his side. And I don't remember firing my machine gun, but I had my hand in the trigger housing ready to fire when I got hit. So when I fell to the floor, I was on the floor. I got disconnected from the ICS from the phone line, so I couldn't tell anybody anything. I'm laying on the floor saying, that's it, man. I tried to get up. I couldn't get up because I immediately lost the use of my right arm because I got hit in the chest. Where did the uh, other bullet hit you? Uh, one went, uh, hit me in the chin and grazed my neck, and the other round went into the chest between the clavicle and the jugular vein. Oh, wow. Then took the tour, went uh, down, took out the top of my right lung, hit three ribs, and went out my back, went around my shoulder blade, which was amazing. The round went around the shoulder blade and out my back. The shoulder blade, I was told by physicians later on when they looked at the scar on my back, because they couldn't close it immediately. They had to wait for the, the skin to become more pliable because the, the hole in the back was probably about two or three inches uh, in diameter. That's insane. From just Was it a standard 7.62 round? What kind of round was it? No, it was 30 caliber machine gun. Oh, 30 caliber. Okay. It was 30 cal. It, I found this out later that uh, what had happened by the time the planes flew in to get these guys out, they had run out of ammunition, the grunts, and it was hand-to-hand -hand combat. They captured the machine gun and took two guys prisoner. They got two NVA prisoners and got our machine gun back. That's how I was told that it was a, one of our machine guns that they had captured that we recaptured. That's what hit me. Um, wow. But as the plane was approaching uh, the LP, we ended up flying back to the LPH-2. I confirmed all this with uh, declassified information from uh, – the Marine Corps, they declassified the uh, squadron after action reports. And I got copies of all that. And it was just weird reading it because it's things I remember and things I were told that are now documented in this uh, after action report. We ended up flying back to the LP. The, let me back up. The crew chief then all of a sudden said that he didn't hear me firing anymore. He turned to the window, and all he saw was a machine gun hanging out, the M60 hanging out the window uh, on the swivel, and I wasn't there. When he looked to the floor, he saw me laying on the floor on the deck of the aircraft. So right away, he went to the radio and, and radioed, you know, the gunners hit, the gunners hit, don't land, don't land. I felt the helicopter lifting up, so I knew then that I would be okay. I didn't know the plane got hit. I just knew that I would be okay. At least that was my thought. I wasn't going to freaking die here. And that's what I said to myself. I'm not going to fucking die here. I could feel the helicopter lift, and they were flying us back to the LPH. How much pain were you in? None. None. I got to say, I was in no pain because of the shock. I, I assumed of being hit. I felt no pain. In fact, it was funny because I had my helmet on. And I was wearing flight gloves, which are very, very thin leather gloves. And I'm feeling my shoulder and my arm, and I'm looking at my hand, and there's no blood. So I couldn't figure out why the hell I couldn't get up off the deck. I tried to get up, and that's when my lung collapsed. So then I laid back down again because I couldn't breathe. I was having trouble breathing. But I, I was feeling my chest and feeling my arm. There was no blood. That's because the entrance hole is about the size of your thumb. The exit hole, I was bleeding out the back. Oh, well. He saw the blood. So, and then he saw the wound on my neck and he saw the wound on my chin. He thought I got shot through the throat. So he came over, pulled the uh, uh, first aid kit off the bulkhead, 
And it was funny because it was right above my head that it snapped in. He pulls it off the taps and water from the night before the rain had gotten behind the mess, the uh, first aid kit, so that when he pulled it off the bulkhead, the water came down and hit me in the face, which was refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it felt good. And he, uh, he took my helmet off uh, and he wrapped the, uh, the, the compression around, uh, did he put it? Yeah, he put it around my neck. He put it around my neck because that was the biggest wound in my neck. It was about the size of a half dollar. And he put that around my neck thinking I got shot through the neck. When we landed aboard the ship, what happened was the plane started to, we started to land aboard the carrier and the plane started gyrating. What had happened, they didn't realize, was the round that went through the clutch was disintegrating the clutch. Oh, wow. They thought it was turbulence, so they lifted up again to try to make another pass. When they made the second pass, the crew chief got on the ICS again, was telling them, you got to land, you got to land at the mechs. I was bleeding out. They thought I was bleeding out. So the second time they started to land, this time they started gyrating again, and the pilot just, he set it down hard. We had a hard landing on the deck. And what happened is the engine caught fire because of the clutch disintegrating engine caught fire. Uh, I was told they put CO2 down the exhaust uh, of the plane to put the fire out and the Corman come on the plane. And I was amazed at this. The guy thought I got shot in the chin now because of the chin wound. He thought the compress slipped. So he put it around my head. <laughs> None of them knowing that the real injury was my chest wound. Right. So what amazed me, this guy was in a squat position, picked me up. I was 162 pounds at the time, picked me up from a squat, turned me, and laid me on a stretcher. I was more amazed at this guy with his ability to pick me up off the, off the deck and put me on a stretcher than anything else. I was not aware of any, any pain. I'm more shocked that you stayed awake through this whole thing. Like you didn't pass out at some point. No, I didn't. I didn't go out until they put me out. Um, I remember all of this like it was yesterday. Wow. Uh, they, this, they stretched their bearers, uh, took me out of the plane and started running from the plane to the uh, hangar elevator. And as they're running across the flight deck, my right arm uh, was on my chest because they were running and bouncing. I had no control of it. It fell off uh, the stretcher and I yelled because it hurt. So they put me down and they, the Coleman said, what's the matter? I said, oh, my arm hurts. So he picked up my arm, lifted it up and just let it go thinking I had control of it. And it fell on my chest and I went, Ugh, because I didn't realize they didn't know my lung had collapsed and I had busted ribs. So that was the first time that happened. They got me to the um, elevator, the hangar deck elevator, took me down to the hangar deck, put me across two wooden horses, cut all my clothes off. This is where I got mad at the Navy because I had uh, jungle utilities that I was wearing, and I carried a 38 John Wayne style on my left side because I flew window, so the gun was always on the bulkhead side because we transported a lot of Arvins and I was always afraid that they'd steal my pistol. So I wore it John Wayne style on my left side. I had a 10 round ammo belt with a holster and I had six rounds in every pocket of my jungle utilities. I always thought that if we got shot down, I had plenty of ammo on me in addition to the ammo can and the ammo belts that we had in the plane. Uh, when they were cutting my clothes off, uh, they ended up, I remember one of the corpsmen saying, gee, this guy's a walking armory because every time they took, when they took my pants off and my jacket off, it was full of bullets. Mm -hmm. Well, they ended up losing my pistol. I had a, uh, a pistol on my left side and a uh, survival knife on my right side. They lost, they 
somebody stole the knife and somebody stole the pistol. They found the uh, pistol belt, but they never found the pistol. Uh, they cut my clothes off, and I'm laying on the stretcher, and they don't know what's wrong. They're checking my my throat. It wasn't a through and through. The chin was just a it was a graze, and so was the wound on my chin. I started complaining that my back hurt. So they the doc rolled me over on my left side, and he said, "Get this guy up to sick bay right away." Now I'm going to get scared because they put the stretcher on a forklift, get me up to the next level where the sick bay was. And I'm saying to myself, they're going to drop me off this goddamn forklift. I'm going to die because I'm going to hit my head and, you know, get killed instead of getting shot. They brought me up to sick bay. Two uh, guys stepped out, got me into sick bay, put me on the operating table. Then the, the doc come over to me and he said, uh, where are you from, Marine? And I always said Massachusetts. He said, really? So I did my uh, residency at Mass General. I said, good. I said, I hope you know what you're doing. So he said, don't worry about me. I'll take good care of you. And he said, uh, count backwards from 100. So I got to like 98. And he's on top of the operating table, pushing a rod down in my chest. And I grunted because I could feel the pressure. And he stopped. He said, you feel that? That was the last thing I remember. Um, I woke up a couple of days later in sick bay in a bed, and there were two guys in the bunk, one guy in the bottom bunk, one guy in the top bunk. The guy in the bottom bunk, I remember looking at him, had reddish blonde hair. Turned out to be a guy that lives just up the street from me here in another another town right close to me. Oh, really? Yes. I mentioned him in the book. mm mm-hmm. uh, by the name George H. All the guys in the book are real guys, real names. I just don't use their last names. Every guy in the book I've talked to or sent a copy of the book to and got permission to use their name. Uh, George and I hooked up again recently, uh, I'll say two years ago on Facebook. And uh, we met at breakfast one morning and I asked him, are you getting all your veteran benefits? He says, yeah, I think so. Why? So I said, well, you're getting this, you're getting this, you're getting that. And he says, no. Long story, I've helped him get his comp. He's getting his 100%. He's getting his state benefits. And he told me after he got his first retro check, he said, Dan, you'll never have to buy breakfast again for as long as I'm alive. And we go to breakfast every couple of months until this virus shit hit. Um, and we're we're close friends. We're, he got pulled out by the guys behind me. But I got shot. In fact, he'll tell people, Dan lost his arm trying to save me. And he lost use of his right arm. He got machine gun. He was a um, B-5 sergeant recon in the same um, 26th Marine Division that we supported off the carrier. And I met another guy going friendly with. I had coffee with him this morning. He was a mortarman in the same unit, but they didn't know each other. They were in the same uh Third Battalion, 26 Marines uh, aboard the EWO. So when I I got, uh, yeah, about four or five days after the operation, uh, they flew me to the repos. Uh, I was on the repos, and uh, another guy who I've been friendly with, he lives in Texas, uh, they had landed aboard the uh, repos, to uh, deliver blood and pick up supplies to bring back to Iwo. He came down below deck to look me up. And when he was below deck, I asked him if I could try on his flak vest just to see if the flak vest would have saved me. When I put the flak vest on, the vest had a, um, a collar around it. And one of the docs came by and he looked at me and he said, you know, if you would have had that on, the round coming up from the ground would have hit that vest. And instead of going through you, it probably would have deflected up and gone through your head. So I I was lucky that I didn't have the vest on. I feel it was a premonition not to wear the vest. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's crazy. I mean, there's no way to absolutely know what would have happened, right? But it's just, you know, no. one of those things where you hear that and you say, well, at least, uh, you know, somebody was watching out for me at that point in time, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, what, you never know what, I mean, life is, uh, I I always say you got to play the hand that you're dealt. Right. And playing the hand I was dealt. When did you actually leave Vietnam to go back and rehab in the States? Um. Uh, I was on the repos for a month. Okay. Because they tried to fix, they tried to repair the damage and it didn't work. I had seven, I think seven nerve blocks they tried to stop the pain because I was in a lot of pain. I was on uh, Demerol every four hours and they would say to me, the docs would say, try to make it last as long as you can. uh, But if you need it, ask for it. Uh, but I could only get it every four hours. And the longest I ever went was like eight hours and I was dying. Uh, but they tried the nerve blocks. And now, the, but what they, was the pain like? I mean, you said you had no use of the arm. So how is it in pain? I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Okay. The surgery that I had on the repos, um, the surgeon actually was, his name was uh, Stuart. Last name was Stuart. He became the physician in charge of the Agent Orange program in Washington, D.C. when I was working there. <laughs> but he was a surgeon on the repos that offered on my arm, on my shoulder. He said, I remember going into surgery and coming out of surgery, and it was like an hour. So I woke up back in my bunk. He came in, sat on the side of the bunk, put his arm on the other side of me, and he said, we tried to fix it, but when the round went through you, what happens is the rounds are red hot, it cauterized all the nerves when it went through my what they call brachial plexus region of my of my right shoulder. Mm-hmm. Cauterized everything. The only nerve that left intact was the nerve that transmitted pain from the brain to the arm. No, oh, you got to be kidding me! <laughs> all my all my joints, my uh, my shoulder, my elbow, my hand. You couldn't touch the palm of my hand. It was excruciatingly painful if you touched the palm of my hand. So he said, I'm sorry, he says, but you'll probably never get the use of my arm, your arm again. And he was crying. It was the first time that I knew that I wouldn't get the use of my arm back again. And because he was crying, I cried. They came over, gave me a shot of Demerol, knocked me on my ass. And uh, he then, after that, tried nerve blocks and they never worked. The longest anyone, any one of them worked was like 20 minutes. The downside of it was they inject this carbocaine into the nerve that was transmitting the pain to try to deaden the nerve. And it would stop the pain, but I would go blind. What? I couldn't see. I couldn't see. So they'd have to walk me back to my rack. And he said, if anybody ever tried to do anything other than carbocaine, if they try to do alcohol, he said, you might as well put a 45 to your head and blow your brains out because it'll kill you. So don't let anybody do alcohol. I got back to the States eventually uh, about around the beginning of November is when I hit. November 66, right? November 66, okay. just before the Marine Corps birthday, mm-hmm. um, because I didn't get to celebrate the Marine Corps birthday because I was on my back at Chelsea. And they tried to do nerve blocks there. They did a couple of them there. And it was the same result. It was horrible. I said, no, no. So they shit canned me and sent me to the VA in Providence. Providence tried physical therapy. And I worked and worked and worked and worked, or they did, because I couldn't move the arm. They would move it, trying to get it back into shape. And I can remember uh, probably the worst incident was... I put my arm, they had a hydrotherapy. They had me doing hydrotherapy. I put my arm in the hydrotherapy tank and or the therapist was running the water. She got a phone call, left the room. So I lifted my arm and put it in the tank and the water's running in the tank and I'm not paying attention. Well, let's get up to 104, 106 degrees. And she comes back in the room. She says, oh my God, what'd you do? I took my arm out of the tank or she did. And I was burning myself. I didn't feel a thing. Oh, wow. I couldn't feel anything except pain in the joints. So 
So after this, she said, no more hydrotherapy for you. And they started doing regular PT. Well, I would face away from her and she would be moving my arm around, moving my arm around and it hurt. It was, it was horrible, horrible pain. She finally said, she said to me, is that hurt? I said, nope, nope. She leaned over and saw that I was crying and said, are you crying? I said, yeah, it hurts so bad. I wanted my arm. She said, that's it. I'm not, no more PT. That's when they shipped me off to Jamaica Plain up in Boston. Uh, the orthopedic residents would come in and they'd, they'd stick needles in my arm. And uh, one resident came in and I was looking away and I said, look, just please don't put the needle in my elbow. Don't put it in my hand. You can stick me all you want in the upper arm and the forearm, but I don't feel anything except in the joints. So I looked away. I could feel her turn my hand over, palm up. I just kind of went, please be careful. She took the blunt end of the needle and just touched me. You could have taken me off the roof, off the ceiling. I, I jumped. I said, oh, my God. She said, that's it. She referred me to the amputee clinic. And that's when they discussed the amputation and said that they recommended the amputation at the shoulder uh, because of the pain I was having. And it was a 50-50 chance that I would lose the pain. There was a chance that I might not be pain-free. I said, well, I can't stand living like this because I had what they called a flail arm. It was just useless. Mm -hmm. And I'm, what am I, 20 years old now? with a useless right arm. I said, no, I'll opt for the surgery. So I did the surgery. And when I woke up post-operatively, I looked over and I, the nurse happened to be standing right there. And it seems like they're always standing when you wake up. I said, they didn't do it, did they? Because I could still feel the pain. She says, no, it's gone. So I looked over and I saw this big lump of gauze. Well, they took my arm off. As time went on in post-op, every half hour or so, I couldn't feel my hand, I couldn't feel my elbow, and I couldn't feel the rest of my arm. I was pain-free from that day forward. Yeah. And I have, been, I have been, <laughs> until I screwed my other arm up, and then it's all bad again with, with the sound side, but that ended my pain in my right arm. And that was fitted for a prosthesis. And, uh, I wore that for God, 35 years, I guess. Uh, and when I worked in the post office, I sort of bail with it. I delivered mail with it. Um, a lot of stories I didn't put in the book that I thought of after the fact, um, I'm glad I didn't in a way, and I'm sorry that I didn't in a way. But uh, how so? Well, it it would have made the book a bigger read instead of a short read like it is. <laughs> when you, this is my first, I mean, it took me 48 years to get to this point, and I thought, geez, I'm I'm writing and writing and writing and writing. I have hundreds and hundreds of pages, and it come down to what 120 pages, something like that. And when you write and you you do uh, double space in a computer uh, it just seems like it's longer than what it really is when it gets into a book sure um, but I've gotten good responses from the book and that's that's been uh, it's been nice for me um, personally because I've been like I said I I've it's helped me to re to get in touch with guys that I haven't been in touch with for decades and uh, it's, I had a good career. I did well in the VA system. Um, I helped a lot of people. I did a lot of good work when I worked in Washington. I enjoyed working in Washington back in those days, back in the eighties, it was when computers were just coming into effect. And I, I worked for the VA. I did a lot of, um, when I came back to Boston, after I left Washington, uh, the director in, uh, in Washington kept me on. Uh, they had a national television program that uh, the prosthetic service ran uh, every couple of months. And they had me on uh, 
on the television show as their subject matter expert as far as a prosthetic program is concerned. So that was nice. I would fly to Washington every couple of months and do a, a one-hour TV show and fly home. And oh, by the way, the name of the book is Deck House, My Story. You know, we referenced it in the beginning, and, and obviously it is, is doing really, really well. And I love the fact that people have been connecting with you over it. But I wanted to focus on your experience the decision you made to go work for the VA, your experience there, and sort of how that all came to pass. Because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, like going to work for the VA is a conscious decision, right? It's not just like a job you fill out and do. I, I don't. Maybe back then it was, Dan, but I, you know, nowadays, like if you're going to work in that environment, you know what you're getting into. Yeah, I. Well, initially, I was frustrated because when I applied for benefits to the VA. Well, after I was wounded, I was denied a couple of times because I was on uh, military retirement. Back in the day, back in the 60s, you had to choose military retirement uh, or VA compensation. I took military retirement because it was the first thing they offered me, not realizing I could file for comp after I left the military. I was making 156 bucks a month. It was back then was a lot of money when you're living at home with your mother and father <laughs> and not having to buy groceries. But if you want to have a family, 156 bucks a month, uh, I mean, rent back in those days for me was like uh, 20 bucks. Was it 20 bucks? 200 bucks a month was rent. I couldn't afford it to, to pay rent. Anyway, I went to the VA and I remember the VSO was a female and she said to me that uh, the VA hasn't rated you yet uh, for loss of use. I said, well, what's holding it up? Well, you got to go for a comp exam. So I go for a comp exam, and I remember the surgeon, the surgeon, the doctor asking me a bunch of questions, and the one question that really stuck with me was he looks at me and he says, are you right-handed or left-handed? <laughs> I said, oh, I'm left-handed. He didn't say, what were you? He said, what are you? Well, he checks off that I'm left-handed. So when I Oh, don't get, even tell me. When I get the report, when I get the rating decision, it says amputation, right arm, in parentheses, minor, which meant it wasn't my dominant limb. I didn't know that when it's your dominant limb, it gets rated higher. Well, I'm just a dumb... Marine veteran. Anyway, I, I'm pissed off. I, I go back uh, to the uh, VSO, and now I'm, I go to Jamaica Plain. They take my arm off. I go back to the VSO in Rhode Island, and I say, okay, I was a very angry guy. Okay, now what the fuck are you going to do? They took my arm off. Is that enough for you? The woman started crying. I really upset her. She goes into her boss. I remember the guy's name. He's retired and probably deceased now. Franz Meichlin was the chief adjudication officer. We became friends later in my career. He comes out and he says, I'll be handling your case. Come in my office. He, he says, you upset my VSO. I said, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm pissed. He said, I'll take care of your claim. So they did. They processed the claim. I got VA comp. Now I'm getting 300 bucks a month instead of 150. I was wearing my artificial limb. I had to go to prosthetics in Providence to get permission to get it repaired. And the guy that was working there at the time says, gee, how'd you like to work for the amputee program? I said, what's that? He said, well, we have a program, you know, like what I do, you can help out other amputees and, you know, what you got to do is write a letter and I'll recommend you, but you got to write a letter to Washington. Oh, okay. So I writes a letter to Washington, sends it to him. He sends it to Washington. I get hired as a prosthetic management trainee working at the, the old outpatient clinic in Boston, Court Street Clinic, which is now a, um, a veteran center. Uh, but the guy that hired me um, was a great guy, BK. Uh, amputee, baloney amputee from Korea, uh, a black man, super, super nice guy. Taught me probably most of what I learned in the two years I worked under him. 
I worked for a year as a trainee. Uh, my first job was at the Jamaica Plain VA as a staff rep. And then I got hired as a chief in Providence. I was there for seven years. I got put in for a transfer to uh, California. I got divorced, went to California. I worked there for three years. Uh, wanted to come back east because I had two boys here in Massachusetts. I got a job in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. I worked there for a year. When I got a call from Washington, asked if I'd uh, like to be a program analyst for the prosthetic program in Washington, D.C., which was one of the goals that I put down when I first applied for the job. Um, I got to uh, D.C., worked there for three years. And then the guy in Boston who I actually trained with was a Marine amputee uh vietnam uh come down with cancer he ended up uh he contacted me and said he was going to retire and asked if i wanted his job and because we both worked for the same guy in boston at the time he just i lateral transferred to, back to boston i worked there for uh, three years until i got offered a job in the private sector which was a mistake i left uh, the va three years later i wrote to Washington saying, hey, I'd like the job back in the VA. And they hired me to work in West Haven, Connecticut to hmm. start a prosthetic program in Connecticut. Oh, wow. With blind rehab center. They had a huge budget. Um, one of the few blind rehab centers in the country, but they never had a prosthetic manager. It was always run by a clerk. So I ran that program, uh, got that started. Uh, then a position opened up in uh, – 20 minutes from my house because I was driving to Connecticut every day, two hours and four minutes one way uh, every day for a year until the position opened up in Brockton. I applied for that job because it was a higher, higher grade and 20 minutes from my house. So I got that job as an assistant. Uh, and then Providence opened up again. And I said, well, you can't pay me because I make more money as an assistant in, in Brockton they called me back and said, we'll pay you if you come here. So, okay. So I went back to Providence and then my associate director at the time in Providence uh, wanted to start uh, a, a vision manager program that we have been pushing for years. When the VA broke up into visions, uh, I became the first prosthetic program manager in New England. And I was in charge of eight VA facilities in New England and we were doing well. I had I was able to get money for the program. I was able to get FTE. Um, I I enjoyed it. It was the problem. What I didn't enjoy was the traveling, because Washington was bringing me there. Uh, I had to travel all over New England. Washington was sending me to everywhere. I was going to Atlanta, Indianapolis. I was in Indianapolis when 9/11 hit. I was there for a meeting. And I couldn't get home. Yeah. So I went to uh, Ryder rent a truck and I rented a box truck. I threw my luggage in the back of the truck. I was with the guy from uh, New Hampshire. He threw his luggage in the back of the truck and I said, we're heading home. We drove to New Hampshire. I threw him out in Manchester uh, airport to get his car and I drove home. Uh, I was on the way home when I got a call from my vision director and she said, no, I'm just checking on my guys that are traveling. I said, well, you're going to be there. I'm going to stop and see you. I says, I know we got a meeting. She says, no, you don't have to come. I said, no, no, I'll come. I'm not dressed. I don't have a shirt and tie. I'm in my dungarees, but I showed up there and I told the doctor, I said, I got one more year and I'm leaving. I can't do this anymore. Uh, 9-11 just kind of put the cherry on the top for me. I had enough time. I was old enough. I had the years. Uh, I had enough. I had my high three and I just wanted to get out. So a year later in July, uh, I retired 2002. And then I ended up getting a job working here in uh, city of New Bedford as their VSO. I worked there for uh, eight years, got my tenure and retired from there. Um, I like to say that when they hired me, the city council hired me in New Bedford. Um, they said they needed their VSO to do more outreach. 
okay, I'm good at that. Uh, I started out with 50 clients. I ended up with 500. Impressive. The budget went from $160,000 a year to $3 million a year. So it was a it was a good program. It was helping a lot of people. It was a, it was a financial assistance program that the state runs in Massachusetts, and most of that money went back to uh, veterans and widows of veterans that live in the city. And the city was reimbursed seventy five percent of every dollar they spent. So it was a great pro. It is a great program. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did that there and I, I retired from there. And then I got a call to um, be the VSO here in my hometown. I did that for three or four years. And then I turned that over to another guy who wanted the job. And I got a call and helped out a couple other communities that were, that were short uh, guys that would resign and I'd help them out with their program. But uh, I still help guys now and then I've helped probably three guys in the last couple of months guys that I served with in Vietnam, um, Marines who've had heart attacks Mm -hmm. and that's all compensable. Um, I wanted to ask you, Dan, uh, about uh, your relationship with your dad and your sort of, uh, I I guess, attitude in your post Vietnam life, because, uh, your father was a World War II vet and, uh, he obviously, you know, went through an experience that was different than yours, but, you know, you'd have every right to be angry. You, you, you as an individual, given what you know, uh, you know now, would have every right to be angry about a lot of different things, as many Vietnam vets are. And I don't think uh, those of us who have chosen to wear a uniform, you know, begrudge any of those those vets their anger. Right? We we sort of understand it to a certain extent. But I just kind of wanted, you know, to to hear you talk about, you know, your relationship with your dad and and how your relationship now is with your children. Yeah, he, you know, growing up, my father was my hero. And at the same time, I was later on in life, uh, I became angry at him for not talking to me about his experiences. My father had PTSD. He was rated with, uh, initially, uh, anxiety neuroses. Uh, it was shell shock and World War One anxiety neuroses. And, uh, and then it became post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and my father was that way. He was an angry guy. He was hard on me growing up, which also kind of lent me to enlisting in the Marine Corps because I remember the day I enlisted, I told him, I said, Dad, I just enlisted in the Marine Corps. He said, you don't have the balls. Okay. I went to see my mother and she cried. But that's how my father was with me. He was tough on me. He was tough with me growing up. And I was kind of angry. Um uh, in that he never talked to me. But I remember stories from my aunts and my mother that after I was wounded and he heard that I was wounded, he became, he didn't go to work. He sat in his chair looking at the wall uh, until I came home. And then once I came home and I knew he knew I was okay, he went back to work and we talked very seldom. I can't tell you a conversation that I've had with my father. And that's hurtful to me today. Um, I always kind of had a feeling that he was jealous of me because uh, I was 100% and he was only, he ended up getting up to 50%. In fact, I told my mother, uh, he died of congestive heart failure. So I applied for uh, those benefits for my mother after my father died, when this law changed, uh, giving POWs who die of any heart condition, giving their widows DIC. Well, I applied for my mother, and I used to tell her, my father's got to be rolling over in his grave because you get more money than he ever got as a veteran. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's a bad commentary on the VA because it takes them so fucking long to approve things. It's like all the guys that are struggling with different uh, different issues that they feel are a result of Agent Orange and exposure to Agent Orange, that all the different cancers and the Parkinson's disease uh, and those kind of things, that it takes uh, the National Institute of Health and the VA to agree that, yes, these can cause these problems because there's a higher percentage of 
cancers of Vietnam veterans there are in the private sector as a result of exposure to Agent Orange. But I, I, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about my dad. I still love my father, and I miss him to today. But I'm angry maybe at myself that I didn't approach him either. I never asked him anything. Uh, we never sat down over a beer. I think we sat down over a beer once in my life when I came home. We went to a local tavern and had a beer. And that was the only time I ever sat down with my father to have a beer. Wow. I mean, he, do you think that you might have changed? Forget the, the, the VA portion of things and, and that sort of way of helping him. Do you think that just maybe having those conversations might have changed him and, and your relationship? I think they might have. I think they might have. I, I can remember when I worked in Providence, I couldn't help my father get a pair of eyeglasses because of the regulations at the time. When he finally got his, well, I think before he got his 50%, the VA came out with a public law that allowed POWs to get dental care. Well, my father used to pay for his dentures, thousands of dollars to get dentures. I called him up one day and said, Dad, you got to apply for the VA dental care because you can get free dental care, free dentures from the VA, free. And they will send you, because of where you live, to a local dentist. Well, they did. And he got dentures. You think my father ever said, thanks, Dan? Does that bother you? It, it does. It bothers me. Because I reached, as soon as I, I read this, like with my mother getting benefits from my dad, as soon, in fact, when I did the thing for my mother, I took the application to my mother and I said, I'm going to sign this. She says, what is it? I said, I don't, I'm not going to tell you because I'm going to let this go through. If it goes through, then I'll tell you. Well, then I called her up and I says, when you get a check in the mail, deposit it in the bank right away because I got a phone call that it got approved. She got her check and she said, what happened? I said, I'll explain to you when I see you. So I told her all about what happened and it helped her to live comfortably at the end of her life. Thanks to my dad. When you look at the VA now, uh, and you see sort of where it is and what you had to go through. Is there a way to sort of pinpoint the systemic issues that need the most attention for the VA? Well, I always said when I retired, uh, guys like me and people that work in the VA system for years that do, I mean, we got a lot of knuckleheads, but there are a lot of good people that have worked for the VA system in a lot of different departments that, after their longevity, are retiring, and they lose that uh, that knowledge. They lose that knowledge base. I can remember thinking with well, a lot of adjudication officers that I knew who were very, very good at their job were retiring because they were frustrated because of the restrictions placed on them. Well, they would retire because the VA, they were top step at their grade level because the VA wanted to bring in these guys who have master's degrees at a lower grade level because they're going to climb up the ladder, but they want to bring them in because they can pay them less money. Well, they don't know shit either. They don't know the regulations, but you're bringing these people in because they have a master's degree or a bachelor's degree. What do they know? They replaced me in Boston with a um, when I was a chief of prosthetics. They hired a chief of prosthetics who had a degree in physical therapy. She didn't know shit about amputees. She didn't know shit about hospital beds or wheelchairs, but because she had a degree, they hired her. And that's what happens. They're losing that that basic knowledge that people have learned over the years. I mean, I used to pride myself in the fact that I retired making really good money in the VA system. I've got a high school education. But I learned by traveling around the country at different VAs purposely to learn I worked at the largest spinal cord injury center in the country at the time in Long Beach, California. I learned more out there working with SCI patients and wheelchairs and the equipment that they need than a lot of people would learn in their lifetime. Uh, I worked at a small general medical and surgical facility. Uh, I worked at facilities that had small orthotic labs. I worked at facilities that had huge orthotic laboratories where we used to make 
artificial eyes, artificial lungs, braces. We used to do wheelchair repairs. We did all that in-house. I learned the program. Guys today, I'm sorry, they, the guy who's the Vision chief in, in Vision One, he's been from Manchester to Providence and now he's in charge of the program. You know, I, I have, we used, the training program used to be a real training program where you learned how to do things. You went away to different places. They sent you to the Blind Rehab Center for a week. They sent you to a spinal cord injury, injury center for a week. They sent you to a large VA for a week. They had a training program. They don't do that anymore. That training program's gone. The people working in Washington in the prosthetic program, none of them work in the field. Even when I worked in, in central office, mm -hmm. I, was, I had more field experience than my director and my associate director did. And that's why I didn't take any shit from them. Dan, do you think that if we had more veterans working in the VA, things would be better? Yes. Because, I yeah. mean, I keep hearing you talking about the, this experience and, and working through the ranks. I, I would just say generally, and again, I've never worked for the VA, obviously, but nobody knows our ailments better than we do. Kind of nobody knows what we need better than we do. And it seems like we got a whole bunch of people who have never been through what we've been through deciding about what our future is going to look like. Yeah, and that's exactly what the, the core of the prosthetic program was initially back after World War II was to hire amputees – so that when the amputees went through their amputation at the VA or came home as the amputees, you had an amputee that you could talk to that's been through the same experience and can tell you what to expect. Not somebody who's a physical therapist that can tell me what it's like to be an amputee. Because yeah. they don't know what it's like. And it's... It's frustrating. I'm no, I mean, I listen, I, I hear your frustration. I get it. I mean, I, I would feel the same way. I mean, you know, again, I, I find it incredibly frustrating just dealing with the VA for simple, small things. Um, I, I can't imagine when, you know, comparatively speaking, there, there are vets out there who have much worse problems than I do that they have to deal with that uh, sort of, you know, uh, can be very disillusioned, disheartening on a day-to-day -day basis because you're sort of stuck in this place you can never get out of, uh, or at least not without help from, from the VA. Yeah, and there are some good... Good people. I have a sure there are. Yeah, absolutely. Finally, I have a primary care physician who is the salt of the earth. She takes care of me like nobody in my fifty years dealing with the VA has ever taken care of me like she has. And I've known her for a long time. When I worked at the VA, uh, I knew her because we worked there, uh, but. I didn't get her as a primary care physician until after I left the VA. And I specifically asked for her and the chief of primary care. He, he had approached me to do a favor for him at the time. I did the favor for him and I said, okay, I need a favor. He said, what's that? I need a new primary care physician. He says, who do you want? So I told him what I wanted. He said, well, you know, she only takes care of, she's in charge of the women's program at the hospital and she only handles a few Male patients. I said, well, if she'll take me, that's great. If she won't, that's okay, too. But just ask her. Well, she did because she knew me. And she knew that I – it's no bullshit. Um, what you see is what you get with me. I'm going to tell you straight out, for the, I think you're an asshole. And um, <laughs> my last primary care physician before her uh, told me that I, I was obese and I needed to lose weight. I said, you're telling me I need to lose weight? You should get off your fat ass. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're telling me to lose weight. I said, and you don't even get up to examine me off your chair. I said, get out of here. And I walked out. I had a, I had a problem with a – when I retired, that's when the PTSD started to get to me. Right. And they sent me to a PTSD clinic in Rhode Island because they didn't want to go to the local clinic because I knew the people and I thought they were all assholes. So send me to somewhere where they don't know me. So they sent me to this guy. It turned out to be he was a licensed social worker, retired uh, Marine Corps. I think it was a gunny, retired gunnery sergeant, Marine Corps, peacetime guy, never been in combat. First visit, I go there with my resume, my bio. I gave my bio because usually the first thing is I want to talk about who you are, what you did, blah, blah. I said, read this. I'll come back next week. So I go back, he says, wow, you see, you've been around, did a lot of stuff. I said, yeah, 
I've done a lot of Faust stuff. We went, we had a couple of meetings and it was like chit chat stuff. Then one day he says to me, you know, not everybody who served in combat has post-traumatic stress disorder. I said, what? I didn't say anything more than that. I left. I never went back. I kept getting notices to report, notice to report. I just never called. I just said, screw you. I get a call from the chief of PTSD, who I knew. He said, Danny, so what's going on? We're concerned. I, I, you think I'm going to commit suicide because I'm not showing up for this clinic? I said, the guy's an asshole. I said, he told me, and I told him what he said, that not everybody in combat has post-traumatic stress. I disagree with that statement. If you serve in combat, you got post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are, what you did, but you served in combat. I'm not talking somebody who served who worked in the mess hall. I'm talking about somebody who served actually in combat, a line guy. I said, you know, I picked up bodies. I did medevacs. I picked up KIAs. I picked up WIAs. I got shot at. I got shot. And you're going to tell me I don't have post. I don't got post-traumatic stress talking about it. So he said, well, would you mind coming back if I give you somebody else and come? Don't go to the outreach center. Come here to the clinic. And I said, okay, doc, uh, because it's you, I'll come. So I went, and it was a female PhD, and we we talked for months and months, and she finally discharged me. And when I came home, my wife said, "Well, what did she say when she discharged you?" She told me that I got to stop dealing with veterans. My wife said, "You can't do that because that's all you've done for the last fifty years." I said, "I know, but that's what she said." So. It is what it is. Well, to a certain extent, it's your personal PTSD on top of others' PTSD that sort of gives you more of it, right? I mean, that's kind of what it sounds like. Um, yeah. There's, there's a lot of anger and frustration over the, your inability to help them to the level that you wanted to help everybody, and that sort of leaves you feeling wounded again. Yeah, when you deal with – I think it's worse for me when I'm dealing with assholes. You know, when I'm dealing with guys that are um, – I wanted to go, but, you know, I couldn't go because, uh, you know, I got this problem with my knee and yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't need to hear that. You know, and when you hear stories about guys who, oh yeah, I, I got post-traumatic stress because I was in Germany and, uh, I watched all the, all the wounded guys come home with that PTSD. Then you find out the guy was a fucking clerk typist. I said, well, what did you do? Oh, I, I was an admin. Oh, and you got post-traumatic stress. What, your file cabinet hit you in the knee and you got PTSD? I mean, I, <laughs> come on. You know, those kind of stories just go up my ass. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there is a, a – in every population, there's a subset that, that will try to gain the system, right? And it's, you know, it's unfortunate because it sort of devalues the – the legitimacy of certain other things or calls into question the legitimacy of certain other things that shouldn't be called into question, i.e. similar to a false rape accusation. Yeah. You know, a fake rape accusation can really damage other people's situations as it goes forward. So uh, it, it's the same thing with people taking, you know, false claims to the VA that, and more than anything, it chews up time, right? The, the time that they don't have to waste. It, it chews up time and resources that they, they shouldn't be focusing on. So uh, that point is is ultimately disappointing. But, you know, Dan, I would tell you, I mean, it, it, putting it bluntly, it's yeoman's work that you've done for the better part of, of 30 years in, in your post-Vietnam life, right? I mean, and how much effort and everything you put into uh, creating a better life for veterans. And, and I think that can't be underscored at all. And certainly uh, you still have a passion for it because I can hear it in your voice. You know, I, I can hear that it's still sort of get you out of bed in the morning to a certain extent, uh, even if you're not working in that field every day, knowing that there are people out there who need help and, and deserve help that, you know, there's guys like you around that are still pushing for that. Yeah. And I enjoyed my years doing it. I still enjoy doing it. If I can help somebody, um, I, I just don't like waiting. I got to say one, one more sure. thing, Mark, I listened to your interview with general Livingston. Mm -hmm. I think it was. And I remember a comment that he made about, um, um, People who thank him for his service or give him a welcome home, not that he's tired of that shit. Well, you know, it, that struck a note with me because it's embarrassing to me. Uh, I usually I say thank you to people uh, and I kind of walk away from it. But it's been 50 something years and 
I appreciate it. It's more, I think I appreciate it more when it comes from some, someone younger, uh, like a fourth grader or a fifth grader that the parents have said, you know, he's a veteran, thank him for his service. And a young kid, maybe he's learning something about uh, veteran status or what a veteran really is. And I think that's, uh, that's nice. And when parents are, are teaching their kids uh, what some of, especially the younger kids that are coming back now from Iraq and Afghanistan, OIF, OEF guys, um, we've got a, a number of them in our VFW and our Marine Corps Lead Detachment, and they're great guys. They're great kids, uh, and they, they're they taking up the, the sword, as it were, for a lot of us that are uh, getting older. Yeah. And it's not pretty. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that, if you know, cliche, but team effort overall, right? I mean, I, I look all to, look up to the Vietnam generation. I certainly couldn't have fought the war that you guys did. I mean, it's just, a, you know, I, I think about it now. I mean, I got Kevlar, I got body armor, I got, I got the best weaponry and everything else. I mean, you guys, it was just a, you know, uh, it was walking in a gunfire until you ran out of soldiers or they, or they ran out of bullets, one or the other. And that's just, a, you know, just a, it seems almost a, a different time of warfare that you guys had to deal with. So, okay. you know, I, I, I certainly try to... Um, and I think we do a good job here on the podcast of elevating those Vietnam veterans and, and their status because uh, we don't want them to be forgotten about, right? Like, it's easy to focus on the war on terror folks, as you mentioned, OIF, OEF guys. But, um, the, you know, the, the, we, we look so fondly upon the World War II folks as the greatest generation. Well, un- unfortunately, as time goes by, the Vietnam War, war vets are going to be – you're going to get to a point where there's the last main, remaining vets from that, that, that conflict. And uh, we, we have to do the right thing by them while they're still here. Yeah, and, and what's happening now is there's there's more of us Vietnam veterans than there are uh, World War II veterans because they're dying at such great numbers. Yeah. yeah. There are fewer Korean War veterans because they're getting older as well. They're in their 90s. Um, and what's nice is when you talk to a OAF or OEF guy who is grateful for uh, the Vietnam veterans because of how we treated them when they came home, which is we've elevated them more so than we were elevated by yep. uh, our peers. A hundred percent. And I, I think that's part of the re- part of the reason why we get treated so well is, is a guilt over how America treated Vietnam vets. They, they, they realized they, they were wrong and they wanted to do it better. And uh, I, I think that's a, an important, you know, thing to, to remember. Um, and, and I know uh, uh, many Vietnam vets aren't necessarily still mad at the way they were treated, but you know, they just wish it was different. But they're all thankful that now veterans are getting sort of the uh, the status that they deserve in that sense. Yes. So, yes. Well, I think that's a, that's a good note to end on because certainly you have uh, had a huge role, uh, again, in enriching veterans' lives. And a uh, re- reminder, the name of the book, Deck House, My Story, you guys can get it anywhere, Amazon, uh, wherever you get your major books. But take the time to read this thing. It's a great story and certainly one that uh, sort of ties together uh, you know, generations of, of people in combat. And I think that's, that's really poignant, but, uh, Dan, I certainly thank you so much for your time, uh, continued luck and success with all your work, but just thank you for being here and thank you for being part of the hazard ground. And thanks Mark. And you can get the book through me. Um, uh, I'm on Facebook, Dan LeBlanc on Facebook, and I've got copies here that I can ship out to you. Um, I appreciate the exposure. Well, Dan, again, thank you and good luck. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.